dad and Jay choose a life, not a knife. I'm down here in Essex, I'm at this fighting gym. Within this gym, you've got a lot of swords. Kids have got swords everywhere. Kids have got knives everywhere. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. These are ornamental ones. That's why I've got them. But kids carry these round with them. What I'm trying to say to you kids is, why are you picking knives up when you can put a set of these on? You're not only putting these on, you're disciplining yourself. You're getting yourself fit and strong. You're entering a gym area where you're gonna make friends, get that brotherhood feeling that you're missing out on. You don't need a gang to feel loved. These places are perfect if you're unloved and you want somewhere to burn your energy and get your anger out. Put up a pair of gloves, put your gloves on and put your knives down. That's a knife shout up and down the country. Gloves, gloves on, knives down. Choose a life, not a knife. Bikes up, knives down. It's all the same thing, same message. We've all got the same narrative and the same objective. Put the knives down and put your gloves on. Start dealing with it like men. Welcome to another Liquid Bullet production. Uh, with us today, he doesn't really need much introduction, he's um, trending all over social media, Mr. Darren G. Thanks mate. Uh, welcome to Essex. Thanks Lee, nice First to be here time in Essex. First time in Essex, probably the second time around the boroughs of London as well, so yeah. it's nice to be here. Uh, can we just ask what have you been doing during the lockdown period? Um, promoting this message across social media platforms, training, keeping myself focused, keeping myself positive, not letting the current situation put you into a corner, get me depressed. So, yeah. keep um, yourself above board, basically. Yeah. Um, so, just for viewers that haven't, that maybe don't know about you, some of the new viewers, you just get a little bit of brief of your history. Yeah, well, um, I started my childhood for a year, so I'm one of five brothers. We grew up in the city of Liverpool on a rough island estate called the Drysdale Estate in Liverpool 5. Um, we was alright up until the age of 12, then a lot of stuff started happening within the household. Abuse, mental, physical, whatever. We started going off track and then we were sort of ripped apart on the back of that abuse. Our family was ripped apart by the social workers. Uh, me and our Danny ended up in the care system and then me and the brothers ended up around the city with different people. So how much how much influence has your family had on your life? Um, I think the family name has had an influence on, on my life, but not the not the siblings. Do you understand what I mean? Like my siblings never influenced me at all. The only people that influenced each other out of all of us was probably me and Danny. Danny's my other brother. They, we were the closest. We were the ones that got like tied to the bed by our dad and whipped and locked in the room. And you know, we were the two that we couldn't control, so we got dealt with the way accordingly. Yeah. So that made us. That made us like influence each other. Me and Danny. Did, did you find that that made you sort of the, the crime side come out more? Yeah. It just made us not tolerate um, nonsense of dickheads outside the home. Mm. So we were getting a hiding every other night of a 40 year old man. So there's no way we're gonna go on the street and let a 14 year old kid talk to us like the diddies. You know, so that's the way, that's the mentality it brought. Yeah. We're fighting back. As we're kids, we're fighting back with our dad. So basically we're being trained to fight adults. So when we are fighting on the street, we're fighting adults, but really it's a kid our own age. Yeah. So, so did you find the confidence was growing the more sort of fighting you was doing and Yes. It was it was more about um in the house we weren't getting the attention that you should have got as a child. So that was part of it outside the house. When we were violent we got attention. So the more violent we got, the more attention we'd get. And when we started recognising that we recognised that the attention wasn't respect, it was fear. So the more we were violent, we got the attention and the attention was turned into fear. And when we had the fear, it gave us power. Yeah. And that's, that's, you just end up on this path of thinking you're powerful. Yeah, you and then you start to elevating yourself until the big climax comes. It comes in everyone's life in the criminal fraternity. You know, you'll have a, you'll have a duration where you're flying and then something big kicks in. 
So, so what sort of age would it become from fighting to sort of weapons and guns involved? Well, in the, in the city of Liverpool, and it's like that up and down the land now, isn't it? But I stem from from fighting with my fists to being attacked with a weapon to using a weapon. Do you understand what I mean? So I didn't start using weapons. I was attacked with a weapon before I started using weapons. So I went from 13, 14, I'm 15, I've got a gun in my hand. And this is 20 years ago. You know what I mean? I know of kids, 14, now sitting on a stage smoking weed with a gun in a waistband. That's fact. And that's why I'm trying to scream, choose a life, not a knife. Yeah. It's, it's the stuff really, that sort, of, that sort of age, or, you know, got guns and, were they easy to get hold of? Them or? No, it's what it was is, years ago, you could identify the game kids, and the elders had identified us because we were game. So they'd pull us on board, they'd give us money, they'd give us this, they'd give us that, give us that. Because they know we're game, we're violence, we can do the what the We're best having them on board with us, they, they can do mad shit for us. Good, yeah. And that's how the elders drop the guns into your hands before anyone. I don't just go on what we go, mate, is this phone? I mean, is this gun? You know, it's the people that are using me to fire the gun that's given me the gun. Yeah. And that's what's happening on the streets now. You've got elders giving 14 year old kids a gun to mind in the bedroom. They might even use it, but they're still sitting there with a firearm and, and by the time he's 16, he will want to use the firearm that he's been sitting on for two years. Do you understand what I mean? So yeah. it's all poisonous, it's all bad. So just, just moving off of that sort of subject for a minute. Um, I've seen on social media that you've got stitched up with something to do with your phone. Can you just run us through that? Well, what do you know about the Instagram? When he backed me Instagram and yeah, started so messaging miners as if they're me yeah. and messaging this miners um, family members and screaming at them as if it's all me. Right, so I just started getting attacked. I started becoming popular. My social media platforms were starting to swell. There was a lot of people not liking it and I just started getting attacked. But uh, I could handle that, that way of attacking. It was all easy. You no, know, just little idiots running on platforms giving me shit. But then all of a sudden, I started getting targeted. Different. It was from every angle. Um, so what they've done, when I've been released from prison in 2016, I've had a phone number, and I got it from Boulder Phone. It was registered in my name. The same phone number was the, was the, the backup number, in case any me, I lost any passwords for my accounts, or anything like that. What these individuals managed to do was Go into Boulder phone, they've managed to change my passwords of my phone, have my number changed to a different number, add all the chip and everything put into their name. From that day, they've gone into my emails, they've gone into my WhatsApp, they've gone into my Instagrams, they've gone into every platform I've got and just destroyed me. What do I mean by destroying me? So say I've got an Instagram site and I've had a message off a 17 year old girl and if they did it, it's been a polite conversation, it's not, it's not dodgy. They've gone in, got back on the girl. No way the message is just sat. They've gone in, got back on the girl and started giving a shit. Like she's a little, like she's opening her legs for every man in the world. And, knows, and if she was black, they'd call her the N-word. And then they've gone through me WhatsApp. And since I've been out of custody, I've built a network of people. Legal people. You know, legit members of the public. And in my WhatsApp, they just gone in and targeted them all. So if there was black families, they were being racist. Do you understand what I mean? They were just... They destroyed me. They, they, just, they just sabotaged me movements. I've chosen a life, not a knife. Um, so just going back to that, so you've sort of been a victim of harassment over the last few years. Um, who, who mainly is that from? Do you know? Or? At the beginning, it was just a normal dickhead, jealous of me getting popular. Mm. After the podcast with James English, shit got messy. That's when the real people kicked in, yeah. I was getting fake emails from The Guardian, meant, meant to be this woman called Heather something and Donald McIntyre. I'm believing these are real, but they're not, they're all fake. It's these people lulling me into some sort of conversation, trying to hate me off the back of the conversation. So I put it out there, I got harassed to death. I've done that podcast with James English, um, straight away, I don't really want to speak about them, but anyway, 
that circle of podcasters and now have now been harassing me continuously for the last three months. Sustained attacks. My Instagram, the people that follow me, the people like people that like my photos, they're getting harassed, getting threatened to stop following me, you know, by this group of people, individuals. Mm-hmm. It's hard to deal with. Yeah. It's hard you get a lot of it on the, on the internet, don't you? I mean, even on our last video, you get some good comments and you get people just coming in rubbish. So you just get the ones that are envious of what you're doing, and that's what you'll see. If you, um, what you've got in the, in the podcasting community in this country, you've got a poisonous few at the top who think they're at the top. And if you don't jump into their way or their fold of doing things, they try and get you shut down. And that's basically what happened. Yeah. Uh, so just moving on, uh, going back to prison life, um, with your new message, with the uh, choose a life, choose a life a not a knife. Um, so can you just give us an example of why you wouldn't want to go to jail or why you wouldn't want the kids who listen to you to go to jail? There's loads of reasons, mate. Let me start with this and the main one, which is freedom. Your freedom is priceless. You can't pay no one for your freedom. It doesn't matter who you are or how big you think you are. If you go to jail for 20 years, all the money you've made, all the shit, it doesn't make a fucking difference. The only one thing you've got to think about is your freedom. Now, why am I shouting this message, choose a life, not a knife? Why am I targeting the youth to bring them away from that system? Because that system got privatised 20 years ago. And what it done, the minute the, minute the prison system and the justice system became privatised, it became a business, it became like a shop. You had to buy and sell, you had to move commodities left, right and centre to make the shares go and the profits stay full. Now you've got loads of shareholders that expect a profit every year off these businesses. And these businesses hold the youth. So every prison up and down this country is currently going private, but they need customers. So what you're seeing now is generations of 12, 13, 14 year olds getting geared up for the penal system. They're getting took away from the family, they're getting put into the care environment, they're going from the care environment into the white peace system. From the white peace system, they're going into the con system. At the end of all, at the end of fucked on medication, I'm a survivor of that, and that's why I'm here now screaming back at these kids. Don't give the law the opportunity to drag you into this system. Don't give the law the opportunity to profile and list you, because once you've got that number next to your name, you're not left alone by the justice system. They're on your case continuously. Do, do you find as well that people that have gone into prison Sometimes mixing with other sort of criminals can make them worse rather than better. It does, it does. So what they've done, I forgot how long ago, but all of a sudden the government decided to mix 18 year olds with 21 year olds. So years ago you used to have 16 and under, YO, 16 to 21 young person prisoners, and then 21 adults. For some bad reason the government mixed 18 year olds with adults. So all of a sudden you've got an 18 year old kid on a wing with a lifer that's been in for 20 years. It's not good. All of a sudden you've got an 18 year old kid that's in for robbing a car, sitting there with some lad, living in the same cell with some lad, who's kicked the door in and cut a woman for a car. Do you understand what I mean? So these kids should have went into one area, saved the punishment and got out, but they never, they got put into another area and was educated in crime and got out with better skills to commit crime, better skills to avoid police, better skills to do all, do you understand? If you go to prison now, you're not getting rehabilitated, you're getting educated by the wrong people. So while you was in prison, what did you get treated like? Because you was in there for murders, correct? I was in there for conspiracy to murder. Yeah, we can, that murder came on the, the back of a shooting that happened on the 6th of April with me, me little friend. He got shot dead, he got shot on the chest eight times. Um, within a month we'd, re, we'd retaliated, conspired to kill this fella, ended up, there was a fatality, the, the, the victim was innocent, he ended up getting killed for nothing, just like Craig. And um, I've gone to jail. I've been going to jail since the age of 13, I got dragged there, so I was in the system anyway, so I'm well known for violence throughout the prison system, me and me, our Danny. So when I've landed there, I've had this reputation to uphold, if you like. And that's the way I've done my jail. 
So, so your brother is still in prison at Lanny? Danny, Danny got, um, in 2008, he got a four-year IPP sentence. He's now done 15 years. Regarding your brother in prison, we heard a story that uh, he had some trouble with 10, 10 guards inside. Yeah, well, I think that story came from a prison officer called um, Neil Samway. He's wrote a book and he's, both, he's basically sold his book on the back of Danny's name because the main story in his book is Danny's story. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, it's true. When we went to custody, me and Danny, when we were 13, we got ragged into care by social services. We got stripped away from our mum. We got put into Dyson Hall, children's home. Whilst we're in there, we're getting abused and blah, blah, blah. Danny is fighting men then. He's fighting men then, and he's taking three or four on then. So when we're misbehaving, and these men are coming into Canvas Town as kids, they're rushing us, body shopping us, dead legging us, and all that sort of stuff. But Danny wouldn't give in. So the only way they could deal with Danny's aggression and anger was by putting him in a gym within Dyson Hall three times a week. So at 14, Danny's getting took to a gym and being trained weights three times a week to calm him down. But what that done was it just made him bigger, stronger, and when he did go off, harder to control. Right. So as he's going through the as he's going through the um, the prison system, the white peace system, he's anti-authority. You know, he's fighting with screws, left, right and centre, he's breaking jaws on them, he's breaking arms on them. Even now, right now, they still go in on him, tend up, and break his wrists and break his ankles and shit, you on it. He's just not giving up against them, that's why he will never get out of the system. Um, so, just going back to your case, is there any regrets for the shooting? Yeah, all of it's a regret, all of it. You get caught up in this lifestyle that you believe that you believe what life is, but it's not. So you, you start moving with this gang. All of a sudden you've got this gang on it. All of a sudden you start making a little bit of dough off your drugs and your crime. All of a sudden everything's great, everything's fantastic. But it all ends shit. So basically someone's killed, someone's come to kill me, made a mistake, end up killing a little boy. On the back of that young boy, I've been given some information by the kid that killed the young boy, or conspired to kill me, but he's given me information on who was responsible. We've gone out, Mr. David Regan, we went straight down on the 18th of May, and boom, done him. Under false, and it's, it's one of the worst things that fucking kills me, because he's innocent. Okay. We've been given a name that he was and he wasn't involved, so it, 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 it kills me. I've tried to reach out to the family, I've tried to do whatever, whatever, whatever. it's just not happening. You know, I've got to live with that. Yeah, how, how do you find to deal with that sort of day to day? I've dealt with it. Mm. I've dealt with it. You know, I've been on my knees, I've cried, I've, I've fucking had the empathy, I've, I've put it out there as much as I can to let you know, look, I'm not that type of person what I used to be. It, it's like you get clouded and when you, get a, when you get a chance to get away from it all, it's like you can lift all these clouds away from you. And it makes you sad because you realise that you've become something that you're definitely not. It's not your, it wasn't my fault that I've gone from a 13 year old to a 24 year old getting 18 years. Something happened in my life at the age of 13 which sent me off a fucking rail and I never recovered off it. The adults that were meant to be protecting us didn't witness it, didn't observe the, you know, the traits of someone being abused or whatever. Okay, Darren, can you just give us a bit more information of what your life's like now? Well, now, since I've been out of custody, I'm a reformed character. I don't live off crime. I haven't committed a single act of crime. Um, I'm on universal care. I'm on benefits. Um, at the moment, right now, I'm on bail. I'm on bail from Liverpool Crown Court, and I've been on bail since, for two years now, actually. Coming up to two years. And what are we on bail for? I'm on bail for a set of sacrateurs. Now, sacrateurs is what you do the gardens with, pruners. You know, you cut your rosebuds, keep them nice and all this. So one, this morning, this particular morning, I'm doing, I'm having a baby as well. So the, the girl who's having my baby, I'm doing her in Nan's garden. 
As I've done, I've, as I've done, I've, I've done a man's garden. I've got a phone call off my mate in Manchester. I put the sack of tears in my pocket. Gemma, come on, we're going to Manchester. Go and get the train to Manchester. Pick my money up. Come back. As I land in Liverpool, I'm surrounded by county lines officers. Do you know what they are? They're targeting the kids from the big cities that go out to the little towns and distribute drugs. So when I've come back into Liverpool, they targeted me on that operation. They've arrested me for the sack of tears. They took me into custody. They never gave me no interview. They never gave me no legal phone call. So all the legal, legal objectives, processes that they should have done, they never. They've let me go under mental health. All of a sudden, they put me in court the next morning, trying to get me remanded. We managed to get myself bailed off it. I was on bail for the full year, signing on every day, curfews and all this. This is a set of secretaries, you know me. Yeah, I was just about to say, what, what was the crime, having a pair of secretaries? In possession of a bladed article of Section 2A. In well, other words... I wouldn't really regard that as a, as a weapon as such. It's not really... No, nah, what, what it is, is if I've got a knife on me, but it's for work, that's a Section 2A. So I've got these secretaries on me, but they're for work. So it's a Section 2A, and it's not a knife. But because I've got this message of choose a life, not a knife, and Merseyside Police have had a long, long history of hating upon me and my brothers. They don't want my message to succeed. So what they've done is, they've charged me with this offence of a bladed weapon. I've been on bail for nearly two years for it. I've been to court twice for it. It's definitely not in the public's interest to prosecute me for it. There's no gain from getting me a conviction on this other than wrecking my message of choose a life, not a knife, and that's their incentive. So for two years of being on, of being on, being on bail for this, having to sign on at police stations, having to go to areas where I shouldn't be going or because of the threat upon my life. The police officer's been on, on, on sick leave since the day after he arrested me. So 150 days, he's still sick. But they never informed us, they never get... So it's not like prolonging it just to keep... So it. basically is, they didn't want to... What happened is, when I got out of prison, I was on 18 months licence. And my, my licence ended on December 2017. By the time April 2018 comes, I'm on bail for these secretaries. And then I've been on bail since till now. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. And what I've been doing, signing on every Wednesday at a police station. And that's just like being on probation and being on license, going to probation, signing on. So that's basically what they've done. They, they kept me on a leash for two years on the back of these secretaries instead of just letting me go free. So is, do you think this is going to get dropped or is this actually going to go somewhere? Well, I wanted to go somewhere because I, now I'm filing for malicious prosecution because there's a lot of historical... There's a lot of historical situations where the police have been found guilty of attacking us and settled out of court. And part of that settlement was not to mention it in the public domain. Yeah. But now I can mention it because the duration's passed. So my defence now is malicious prosecution and that's all going to come out in the courtroom. And I, I can't wait for it. That's in May. Have any of members of your family suffered from your message going out? Yeah. Early days they suffered. They've all suffered. I've sacrificed loads of people because of the message, but my older brother Billy, he hung himself a year before I got out of prison. You know, he was depressed, he'd been abused, he hung himself. He had a young son called Young Billy, who was 14 back then. Now, when I've got out, I've had this reputation of, I had stuff locked down. And so when I've got out, these, these new kids thought I was gonna get out to start shutting shit down and getting graft back on, but he had no intention to. But they got that shook and not afraid of what was going on. Um, they started attacking me nieces and nephews. So one day, the, um, a car slammed on with these three kids in from Liverpool, three rats. They've jumped out, they're all 27s, they've grabbed my 14-year-old nephew, put him on the floor, put the blade to his chin and slashed his chin and was saying to him, um, Tell your Darren where the powerful ones round here, where the main men in Europe, he's fucking not and he's not. Do, 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 do. So from that point on, I'm out of jail here, mate. I, I want to remain free. I don't want to go back to jail. I'm not participating in selling drugs, I'm not participating in violent crime. I'm not earning nothing financially from crime at all. You know what I mean? All of a sudden, I've got these rats provoking me to the highest level. Want me to react, want me to pull a gun out and go and kill a few. 
the half won because of what was Dominity done that to my nephew. I'm out there looking for this rat. Now I'm seeing this rat and he's running away and coming back in cars with guns and shit. And I'm seeing him everywhere he goes, but he's just a shit house. I've got him that shook. He's refusing to come round certain areas and that. After the shooting, he flew to Dubai to go and be with his kingpin in Dubai and, and, and no thinking of it because he shit himself. So I'm looking for him and I'm hunting for him. Now the people who we work for was the Irish people. Don't need to mention names because they're all, it is what it is. He was working for these Irish people. Now these Irish people have tried to kill me for this kid. That brings me back to 2017. That was the Irish that tried to take me out there, but they paid little rats to do it. Do you understand what I mean? All on the back of this little rat, targeting my little nephew because I'm promoting this choose a life, not a knife, and I hate drug dealers, shout. So that's why that me, fam me family suffered. Who's suffering the most out of all this? Probably Danny. Danny, he's in custody. Uh, there's a lot of rat, there's a lot of rats in custody, and he will be getting a hard time for what I'm doing out here. But people need to know that I don't speak to Danny. He doesn't speak to me. So if you're damaging him and you're going for him, it's pointless. We're not in contact with each other. It's not going to affect me if you're hurting. He'll probably damage you if you're going hurt him. You know it. But the but the bottom line is my family. I've got no family. I sacrificed all my family before the message. You know it? Yeah. So I don't speak to Stephen. I don't speak to his family. I don't I don't speak to no one in my immediate family now. Why? Because when all this shit kicked in, they all stood back and let me deal with it. Started picking on me with the people that were targeting me. Do you understand what I mean? So they just got get out, sacrificed. I'm leaving this life, you're still fucked in that life. I'm, going, I'm leaving this behind see years later. I cut my mum off because of the abuse at the age of 13. So are you totally out of the area of Liverpool now? Or? I'm out of Liverpool now, yeah. I always go back because I love the city and that's where I want to push this message most. I want to get young Scouse lads, take them away from that lifestyle, take them away from that mindset of it's good to be in a gang because you're protected. You're not. The minute you enter the gang, you're more vulnerable. You put yourself more at risk. Do you understand what I mean? From harm, imprisonment, and death. Can we just ask you a little bit about the situation with Darren Waterhouse, the uh, SAS man? Yeah, well, Darren Waterhouse, what can I say about him, mate? Militant man, very dangerous, SAS trained, been to war all over the world. Um, the same individual got his troops out of Bosnia when we when they were at war in Bosnia, when they were doing whatever they were doing in Bosnia. Um, he got his troop of men out of Bosnia and was brought to the royal palace, knelt in front of the queen and given a military cross on his chest. This same soldier that got them credentials off the queen killed little Craig Barker, my mate. So he's, this Darren Waterhouse has been paid He's come out the army, he's been arrested, he's gone into prison, whilst he's gone into prison for bringing drugs back from wherever he was whilst on duty. He's met these people called um, William Moore and Porky Moore. Now these people have paid the SAS water hours to come and kill me on the 6th of April, but he messed up. He's targeted the passenger seat and got young Craig, point blank down his chest, you know, filter. Uh, that's Darren Waterhouse for you. He's a, he's a professional hitman. He was military. He was SAS, you know, proper. Yes, he he's well renowned throughout the barracks and stuff. Everyone knew of Mr. Waterhouse because of, you know, the heroism he's done. But he ends up on a street killing an 18 year old kid. And I can't grasp how. He's still got a military cross, what the Queen's given, hanging up in his cell. I can't understand how he can still sit there with such high, high acclaim and high fucking... You know, he's been rewarded for one of the highest honours within the military. But he's gone and killed kids on the streets, so why has he still got this... You know, this honour honor of the military, when all he's done is brought disgust and shame upon 
his comrades, if you like. So really, you think he should be stripped of that? He should be stripped of that medal. He should not have that medal. He's, he's went and killed an 18-year-old kid on the streets of Liverpool. How can some soldier be a hero if he's out on the streets killing kids for money off drug dealers? That's my angle with him. Um, what is your biggest regret in life? My biggest regret in life? Not making my own decision. Uh, do you miss the life you had previously? No, I hate it. I hate that life. And everyone that's in it. So uh, now you're promoting Choose a Life, Not a Knife. Um, how's this going at the moment for you? Well, I'm a one-man band. It's not a registered charity, so it doesn't get the, the attention it deserves. But I'm delivering it the best I can. And the reason I deliver it is because it's so powerful. Why is it so powerful? Because it saved my life. And I know it can save other lives. Can, can I just get the uh, website address from you for the viewers so they can look into that? Oh yeah, the, the, you've got a... So I've got, a, I've got a, a clothing brand and you've got these clothes on there, which is Choose a Life, Not a Knife. Every one of these tops or merchandise with this brand on it goes straight back into the message. Now you can get on there on www.l5original.com. There's all the clothes, you've got the caps, there's everything. But the main thing is bringing funds in for the message. All the funds that come into this will be going to community centres directly. There's no second hand that's going through. It's not going through any agencies or receptionists or anyone else is getting a pick of it. Everything I get is going direct to the community centres. So that's why I ask for support to choose a life, not a knife UK. Yeah, it's good. Uh, can I just ask the L5, where did that originate from? Well, L5, so um, whilst I've been delivering this message over the last five years, I've had a lot of people that haven't liked what I'm saying and how I'm doing it. I'm, I'm be, I've become very pro provocative. My words are dangerous, basically. And what's happening is um, someone's come to kill me. An Irish man's come to kill me in 2017. No, 218, sorry, March 17th, 2018, this happened. So I'm out all day, I'm with this friend, this friend's setting me up all day. So that's why I was saying before, I want to go to this, anyway, this Essex place where, where them fellas got yeah. set up in the Jeep. Yeah. That's why, because I got set up on that day. And um, I had this friend with me all day, he's come to me Mars with me, I'm in my Mars, he's run the taxi, I'll just go through the dead fast, I don't want to give you the full thing. He's, he's rang a taxi, I'm still in my mum's, he's gone out and sat in a taxi with his girlfriend, he's, I'm still in the house potting around, he's come back and he went, hurry up, <coughs> hurry up, the taxi driver's fuming, the taxi driver wants to get, because you've been here for five minutes, so I said, alright, then I'm coming out now, so he's left me, gone out, got in the taxi, bang, 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 two men outside my mum's house have pounced on him, so when he's going and gone and sat in the taxi, two, gun, two gunmen have pounced on him, started shooting him, filling him up, when he realised he wasn't me, he stopped. He stopped at his lower half, so he survived the kid. But on the back of that, as soon as that shooting's happened, with my Instagram, I'd been doing live feeds, you know, keeping everyone happy and that, keeping doing rapping and stuff, spitting lyrics and stuff. As soon as that shooting's happened, I've gone in and done a live feed just to let no, no, uh, my followers that I'm okay. And I've turned around and said, um, don't worry L5, I'm alive. Don't worry, L5 is a postcode where I'm from, Liverpool 5 area. So I've said, don't worry L5, I'm alive, I'm still breathing, I'm still achieving, they this, no, just like spat a few lyrics off you. And L5 Alive stayed with me from that day of people calling me L5 Alive, so that's where that stemmed from. Um, so can you just give all the youngsters here a message of advice? A message of advice? Message of advice to the youngsters is simple as this, choose your life, not a knife. It might sound so trivial, but trust me, every time you're about to get into some sort of trouble, think of choose a life, not a knife, it'll give you that minute. It'll give you that minute to just reevaluate what you're about to do next and what's at risk here. You don't want to go into a prison cell. You don't want to go into a prison where it's full of drug dealers who want to rob you and nonsense who want to rape you, because that's what the system's full of right now. Make your own choices. Don't listen to the elders unless it's your mum or your dad. As simple as that. Do make your own your own choices. Live your life free. Go and get yourself a job at 16. Go and get yourself a woman at 18. Have a kid at 25. Have a nice life. 
Look how many kids are locked behind bars in a 12 foot cell and they've got 20, 25 years to do. They're all from our streets. They're only a few years older than you. You just haven't seen them gone to jail, but they went to jail off your street. There's loads of kids off your area, out of your community, that are sitting in cells right now and you need to address yourself. Do not end up in the hands of the law and the hands of the prison system because they do not leave you alone. They destroy you and your family. And your family. So just don't let it happen. Always choose your life over the knife. Always. It doesn't matter what the situation you're in. Just grasp that fact of choosing your life over a knife or a gun or the jail, or the drugs. Enjoy your freedom, live right, and become bright. That's all I can say to you. Have you got any last words for us, Darren, just before we tie up? Um, just one, really, and it's to, it's to all people. It's not just the youth. It's to the youth's parents, sisters, aunties, cousins, mothers. It doesn't matter who you are. What you've got to do, and what you've got to embrace, and embrace fast and sharpish, is this. Every child you see running around your street is your responsibility, not just the mums, not just the dads, it's all our responsibility. All the children within our country, our communities, our cities, we need to be looking out for them. We need to be guiding them. We need to be letting them know that this world is not evil. There is good people within the world and you don't have to go down that path of destruction, entering gangs, entering the prison system, taking drugs, harming girls, harming children, but all the madness, stay away from it, choose your life, not a knife, and trust me, your life will work out sweeter than what you think it's going to be. Look, if you're 13, don't think your life's ended, you don't even know what life's about. The minute you pick a knife up, you're going to know what life's about. Don't pick the knife up until you know what life's about. That's what I'm trying to say. Choose your life, not a knife, at all costs. In every way, doesn't matter where you are, who you were, or what you're doing. Always think about yourself, because you know when you're going to get put into dangerous situations. Choose your life, not a knife, as always.